In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The 24th of September, and we have many great saints, many celebrations. Unfortunately, because of technical problems, we don't have the screen today, but that's all right. You know, uh, more or less, after many, many times of me showing you about the location and the time on the, on the, uh, the timeline. So we'll talk about that, and I think you'll understand. So we have the great and holy martyr, proto-martyr, and equal to the apostles, Thecla. An amazing story. We did that last year. Where Saint, about St. Saint Thecla, the disciple of St. Paul, a wonder worker, an ascetic, uh, and really uh, an amazing example, and well, uh, widely venerated in uh, contemporary Syria and Lebanon and that part of the world as a great saint. Uh, there's a monastery dedicated to her. Uh, we're not going to talk about her today, we're going to talk about someone else. We also have the Venerable Copris, disciple of St. Theodosius, the Cenobiarch, Cenobiarch and St. Theodosius was a great uh, spiritual father and abbot and elder of many, and this is one of his disciples in uh, near Jerusalem, the, uh, the monastery is dedicated. St. Siloan the Athenite, we're going to talk about him today. St. Siloan the Athenite, a contemporary 20th century saint, lived on Mount Athos, we'll talk about him in a minute. Venerable Nicandor, Nicandor of Pskov, the holy venerable martyr of Galaction of Vologda in Russia. The Venerable Dorothy of Kachin, the Holy New Martyr Peter the Alley, the Synoxus of the Saints of Alaska. Did you know that we have, as you, I'm sure you do know, we have uh, saints in America, we have saints in Alaska, and today is the Synaxis. What does Synaxis mean? Anybody know what Synaxis means? Go ahead. All the saints. Yeah, so all together, it's a gathering. It's a gathering. So when we gather together, this is a synaxis, right? And we, we read the synaxarion, which means that's what we read when we're all to gathered together. And all the saints are commemorated there during Orthros, the synaxarion, the lives of the saints, in other words. So that the synaxis of all saints of Alaska would be St. Herman of Alaska, St. Innocent of Alaska, St. Jakob uh, Netzvetov, Enlightened of the people of Alaska, those are three, St. Peter of Alley. And we've talked about them at another time. We'll come back to them on another date because they have several uh, feasts. We also have three, or four, rather, synaxes of icons of the Mother of God. So in the Orthodox Church, we have many, many icons of the Mother of God, which, have, uh, which God has worked miracles through in a variety of ways. Uh, whether it's an, a, a weeping icon, like we just saw reported up in Chicago just last week. There's a weeping icon of the Mother of God. Uh, there's a weeping icon in Pennsylvania of the Mother of God. That means that there's myrrh coming out of the icon, gushing out. There's a weeping icon in Hawaii. and There's, a, there's, there's several in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. And, the, and the, these miraculous icons, they're, I don't know if we can count them. There's so many in the history of the church. We have four of them today that we're commemorating. The Synax is the Panagia Mirtidiotisa, Mirtidiotisa in Kithira. Uh, that is down in the southern part of Greece, right at the end, end of Greece, uh, an island off, off the uh, coast, Kithira. And the Synax is the Panagia Filirum Irmos in Rhodes, another island in the uh, Aegean Sea. <coughs> The synaxis of the Panagia Pantanisa of Vatopedi on Mount Athos, a very famous icon uh, in the monastery of Vatopedi. I wish I could show you all these icons, but unfortunately we can't do that today. Synaxis of the Panagia Verniotisa in Tinos, another island in Greece. So literally you can go around Greece and go, you could just plan your vacation and go from one miraculous icon to another. And, uh, and read about the histories of the Mother of God and her protection of the people of God throughout history. So we're going to talk about St. Siloan. What a shame I can't show you a picture today. We'll show it tomorrow when we correct the things. Well, may I'll show you just a little, let's see if we can see him here. Okay, this is St. Siloan the Athenite. He was a monk on Mount Athos and reposed in the 1930s on Mount Athos. And he has a famous disciple, Saint, uh, not yet Saint, uh, Elder uh, Sophronios. Uh, and he has written much about the saint and given us uh, his life, essentially, is written by his disciple, Elder Sophronios. <clears throat> he lived, uh, he was born in Russia, in Tambov, which is at 
central uh, western, or let's see, eastern Russia. So far from, from Moscow to the east, Tambov. And he grew up there, and he was uh, in his late 20s when he came to repentance. And he understood that he needed to go to the monastery. He went to St. John of Kronstadt, the famous St. John of Kronstadt in Russia, and received the blessing to go and become a monastic on Mount Athos. And he left for Mount Athos, went to Mount Athos, and went to the monastery of St. Pantelemon on Mount Athos, one of the 20 monasteries uh, which the, uh, uh, was, was uh, inhabited by Russians, for the most part, Ukrainians and Russians. And so he went and, and, and lived his life there. Let's, let's talk about that life. It's, sh it's going to be a short recollection of the life because uh, we're gonna, we don't have a lot of biographical details. We have, we have stories of his life that his disciple gave us. But let's see here. Um, it's, we'll do that and we'll get some, some of the stories from his life for us as good examples. So he left, he left uh, in uh, 1893. He was born in 1866. So at the end of the 19th century, he left uh, Russia. Uh, he was called to repentance by the mother of God. And for when he reached 27, he left for Holy Mountain. And he quickly made progress in the spiritual life. He attained to unceasing prayer. That means, what does it mean to have unceasing prayer? That's what they're all, all the monastics are, are, and all of us are see, seeking for. And that is, the Jesus prayer becomes so much a part of our soul and mind that it runs of its own, it, as, it, as it were. In other words, our heart and our mind are constantly uh, invoking the name of Christ within us, in our heart and our noose. And so we have constant communion with God. This is the aim of everyone, and this is why Christ came, became man, that we might have constant, uninterrupted communion with God, and therefore, when that happens, uh, the, everything falls into place. All the hierarchy in the world, all the relations, all the meaning of life, everything falls into place, and we have is what God would intend for humans in terms of communion with God, communion with people around them, and communion with nature, Things are harmonious, and this is the aim of, of, of the spiritual life, is to have total harmony and unity with God and man and all of creation. So this is the key to being constant communion with God through prayer. And he was granted the great blessing to have a vision of Christ himself. And he saw Christ himself and appeared to him. But then the grace of God was taken away. And this is one of the greatest teachings that he's given to us, is how the nature of the spiritual life works. Get, great grace is given to converts, to people who are setting out. Uh, I, I think anybody who's converted to the Orthodox faith can attest that the first time in the church is filled with great grace and joy and zeal for the things of God. But then what happens is that grace is taken away. And you say, well, why? Why does God take that grace away? He takes it away precisely, and St. Siloan passed through Many years, it says here, 15 years of anguish and grief. Temptations of the spiritual foes. And why is that the case? Well, in, in a very short, short explanation, it's because it's necessary for us to participate in our own salvation, to want it, to increase the virtues, to become perfected. <coughs> Otherwise, we won't be perfected. In other words, somebody comes to George, somebody comes to you and says, George, here is a million dollars. Huh? Go do what you want with it. What's going to happen to George? It's really a great gift. He's very happy. He's overjoyed. Oh, my gosh, he's flying, you know? Okay. George is going to be able to go buy all his toys. It's going to be really fun. The problem with, problem with George is going to be he's going to become ungrateful. He's, going to, he's, not going to be, he's not going to have earned that. He's not going to have a participation in that gift. And God wants us to participate in all of the riches and gifts. He wants us to simulate that and for that to become a part of us and for us to have it in great estimation. And sometimes when we're just given something, it's not, that's not how it works. We don't have great estimation. But it's also that this synergy, this cooperation between God and man has to be at, at its height, right? And we have to learn the ways of the Spirit. We have to learn how and why and how to walk in God. Because then we, we lose the grace through temptations. And, and that's a big part of it, is that because we're inexperienced and because we haven't warred against the temptations in the flesh, we fall. And that's 
why most people lose the grace. But it's all within the pedagogy, the program of God. And it's okay. The, 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 the key there is to see, is to have faith, to have trust. That's why in the gospel, everywhere, he says, faith, according to your faith, this miracle happened. According to your faith. Not according to your faith like you recognize me. According to your trust, that's what that means. That you have entrusted in me, you believe in me, you trust me. And so that whole process that he went through, 15 years of struggling against thoughts, against demons, appearances of demons in his cell, and he's praying, and against thoughts of pride, and at some point in the life it says that, um, he said he begs God, why, why, can't, why can't I have this communion? Why can't I, I, I be with you, see you? And the voice comes and says, this is the lot of the proud. This is what a pride, pride man has. And so... Humility, great humility to the point where, after being 15 years of this, he gets a, a word from God. You know, you remember the stories of the Desert Fathers? They would go to the elders in the desert and they would say, Give us a word. Give us a word. Then what they meant was not an opinion, not an idea. What has God told you about the spiritual life? What is a revelation to you as to what I need to do to be saved? That's what that means. And he, a word came to him, and the famous saying that everybody has heard now through the writings of Father uh, Sophroni, keep thy mind in hell and despair not. And so it's, a, it's a hard saying for many of us to understand. What, is it, what does that mean, keep thy mind in hell? I thought we were supposed to avoid hell, and hell is separation from God. What are they saying there, <laughs> keep thy mind in hell? Well, it's all about the need to be deeply repentant and humble and at the same time, to have total trust and hope in God. And that stance of extreme humility and extreme love and trust is exactly where we need to be. That's where we need to be in the spiritual life. And so St. Siloan, and we could talk about that for hours. There's whole lectures and books written on this theology that's been handed down to us. But that, that in, in, in a nutshell, for, what, for our purposes here, what we need to understand is that without great humility, great self-knowledge, great understanding of who we are and our, our weaknesses and our flesh, and that we are, without the grace of God, we are lost. We are on the, we are on the path to hell. And so, and yet, despair not. Despair not, have your trust in God. That's all we can say about that. Then he, he goes on, and he follows, it says here, after receiving this and growing even more in the spiritual life, perfecting the spiritual life, he becomes a disciple in practice of the great saints Athanas, uh, Anthony and Makarios and Pimen and Sisoius and all the other great desert fathers. Truly, he's a contemporary desert father for us on Mount Athos. He became an inspired and apostolic teacher, both living and after death. So he reposes in the late 30s, 1938, just before World War II, he reposes. And yet, that's really when his teaching ministry begins. You see how wonderful that is? He, he leaves this world, and then he begins to teach. Where does that happen? Outside the church. That doesn't happen anywhere. And yet that's the truth, though. His word now becomes spread throughout the whole Orthodox Church, throughout the whole Orthodox world. His word to his disciples are then spread. And he really is continuing to teach people about the spiritual life long after he's reposed. Almost, what are we at now? Almost 82 years later? We're almost there. So, there is, he says, another thing that's very important. Listen to this, everybody. Pay attention to this. The true sign of a Christian, people might say the true sign of a Christian, what is it? Well, I don't know that he believes in Christ. Or, or a true sign of a Christian, he's a nice person. Right? He's a good person. Or he loves, he loves his uh, family. Actually, no. The true sign of a Christian, he says, is to love your enemy. That's when you've arrived. When you love your enemy, then the Spirit of God dwells within you. There's no surer proof that you have arrived and the grace of God is on you when you love your enemy. He says, if you love your enemy truly and see him as Christ, the image of God, the image of God in him, and you love him with all your heart, then you can be assured that the grace of God is dwelling in you. You cannot do that without the grace of God. So when somebody speaks evil of you, somebody accuses you, somebody is rude to you, what do you do? Examine what you do, and you will see how much grace of God you have in you. 
And that is the test. We are being tested all the time. We are being put on the examination table every day, all day long. And if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we'll see where we are and who we are and how close we are to God. It's up to us. He shows us every day. So this is one of the criteria, and this is one of the ways we understand who we are. Do we love our enemy? Do we love the people around us who are, it says in Scripture, your enemies will be of your own household. Don't think of an enemy like on the other side of the planet or across the sea or uh, across the border or another country or, you know, there's all these warring factions. That's not what he's talking about. The enemies are those all around us who make life difficult for us because, not because they're necessarily bad. We don't think like that as Orthodox Christians. He's bad. He's good. That's very pathetic. We don't think like that. We're all struggling. We have the line between bad, evil, and, and good goes right through the heart of each one of us. So it's not that they are actually our enemies. But what happens is we're provoked by their passions, and we see our own passions. And that's also in the providence of God. God allows that for our good, to see ourselves. And so those passions are like rocks hitting each other continually. And if we begin to understand and have humility, keep thy mind in hell, see ourselves, we begin to see that that's all for our salvation. It's all given for us. That's the surgeon doing his work on us. St. Siloan, in his teachings and in his life, have given, has given us so much to contemplate and reflect upon. And I'll just tell you a quick story. Unfortunately, we don't have much time because I... I'm long-winded. Forgive me. I'm long-winded. But I want to tell you a little story because some people think, oh, those saints, what would it have been like to meet St. Silouan, right? Everybody th has anybody thought that? I just, why couldn't I meet somebody like St. Silouan? What would it be if I had met St. Silouan? And we have this great idea, oh, St. Silouan, or, or St. Paisios, right? Oh, if I had only met St. Paisios, what would it be like? Well, I want to tell you a story real quick, just, just to bring it home that it's not what we might think. And that God dwells in people, human beings that are not unlike us. We have the same nature with us, the same struggles with us. It's a story from a metropolitan Athanasius of Lemesu, who, by the way, will be coming here in about one month in this monastery. He's going to be visiting metropolitan Athanasius of Lemesu. And he tells a story uh, about his going to Mount Athos. He had heard so much about the saints and St. Saint Paisos. And he goes and he meets St. Paisos. And he says, you know, he expected wonder workers and miracle workers and all kinds of things to see, you know. And he goes and he says, um, he was scandalized for a moment, scandalized. He was, what? This is St. Paisios. He said, this is the one who, who has only one blanket to sleep with, who walks around in a crooked manner due to his asceticism, who jokes around and gives us food to eat. And so he saw the human side of the saint. And he thought, well, where is the spiritual side, right? He didn't see that initially. But that's how God works. God is humble. God himself is humble. He appeared in the form of a man, and many people didn't realize who Christ was. Many people thought, this is the Savior of the world who hangs around with sinners, who goes around and, 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 and in, the, in the rocks and in the, in the far places and isn't here with us, the Pharisees would say, right? Who's not educated, doesn't have a PhD or something. Uh, and so we see the human side and we, we don't, know what to make of it. So here's a story, he says, that he, he had when he went to St. Pantaleva's monastery, where St. Silouan lived, and he found an old monk who actually knew St. Silouan, and he was all excited, and he went to the monk, and he said, tell me, where are the relics of St. Silouan? And uh, the monk says to him, oh, oh, you Greeks, you're all so dumb. What is all this talk about star at Silouan? We would drink tea and vodka every morning, and now Silouan has become a saint? So what does that tell us? What does that tell us? The man knew Silwan. He, he drank tea with him, he says, every morning, and even some vodka. The Russians like their vodka. Uh, he wakes you up in the morning. And so what is this? This is a, Well, this is the perspective of someone who saw him and saw the human side of him, right? There's a human side. I mean, it's a sinful side. Don't get that wrong. It wasn't sinful. It was human. And that's okay. We can be human. We're, 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 we're not going to deny our humanity to become holy. In fact, it's going to be brought out even more if we're holy. Uh, so they're not unlike us, he says. They're just like us. The only difference is that they don't walk as sinners ruled by their passions. They're holy in their lives. 
they, through their daily prayer, their patience, repentance, the mystery of humility, which is key. Being human, they make mistakes. They have weaknesses. They have character flaws. God does not destroy our humanity. We don't cease to be humans and make mistakes when we become holy. Right? And it's really important, right? And this is one of the lessons we have from uh, St. Siloam was like everyone else. St. Paisius, all the rest. They were like us, and yet they weren't. And yet they were deeply, deeply sanctified. Um, I could go on, but I think we've overrun our time. I'm going to stop there. There's many stories. I hope you, when you grow up and you spend more time with the lives of the saints, spend time and read. There's so much available to read about the lives of the contemporary saints who are so close to us. Any questions real quick before we close? Anything you want to share? Okay. To the prayers of our Holy Father, Silver One, with Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy to save us. Amen. You can come and ask the question if you want.